Tonight's Bible study is on the priorities of authentic apostolic revival. And I'm so thankful that here at Southland Tabernacle, but also around the world, we are indeed in a season of revival, corporately and individually. And if you're in a season of personal revival, I think it would be good just to pause and thank God for a moment that we're in a season of revival, renewal. We're in a season of refreshing. And I'm thankful for the outpouring of the Holy Ghost and the power that we have experienced. But tonight's Bible study, we're going to look at priorities of authentic apostolic revival. And by way of introduction, uh, the book of Acts, it, it highlights several essential characteristics that I believe define a true revival. And if we look at that first revival, it was the beginning of the church. On the day of Pentecost, the Lord poured out His Spirit. But that first revival, it was indeed, it was exemplified by biblical faith. But it was not just faith that was outpoured to the, the Jews. It began to spread to the Gentiles. So it was a revival that began to spread to all ethnicities. And when we look at that revival, there's a lot that we can learn from that and glean from its example. That revival, it illustrates what happens when people experience a fresh wave of God's grace. I'm thankful for the grace of God, the love of God, but also His mercy. His mercy is new every morning. But I also believe there, there's seasons where the, the wave of God's grace is renewed and we're refreshed and, and we're restored. So it's when people experience a fresh wave of God's grace that results in renewed spiritual enthusiasm among the faithful saints and its transmission to unbelievers. Can I say it this way? In other words, it's, it's when a fire over here begins to burn brighter. And uh, I heard the youth, I heard the arise, and, and I heard them praying before the service began. And I had to just slip in here, and, and I came up behind you. I don't know if you even realize it. But I said to myself, I, I want to connect to that fire. That's why I came in, and I got behind the youth. Because I know if you can get close enough to the fire, your life may begin to connect and burn a little bit brighter. Oh, I believe every service we need to come in here, we need to put a few extra logs on the fire. We need to connect with what God is doing. And when that fire begins to burn, you can touch your brother and sister and the fire can spread from the south side to the north side. It can spread to the balcony. It can spread to the overflow. It can pour out into the streets. When the fire of God is lit, it can spread. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Some, that fire needs to spread a little bit, maybe in the back a little bit. Praise God. Hopefully we'll connect with what God is doing. But it's when there's a fresh enthusiasm. Someone shout priorities. priorities. Of authentic apostolic revival. When we experience such ways of God's renewing grace, I believe it leads to personal restoration. But it also leads to corporate revival, and even community recoveries. Notice that it begins with, with, the, with the person, the individuals. And when individuals catch on fire, it can spread to their, their spouse, it can spread to their family, it can spread to their children, and there's personal restoration. And when that happens, also there's corporate renewal. But also, I believe in true authentic revival, communities are recovered. A while back, Bishop, he preached a phenomenal message about it can any good thing come out of Nazareth? And what a powerful service. And he illustrated how the power of God can literally transform a community. I believe that the revival that has begun to take place, I believe it can literally transform Flint. It can transform Burton. It can transform a Swartz Creek. It can transform a Grand Blank. Praise God. But the outpouring of God's Spirit in Acts, it culminates with several fundamental priorities that accompany authentic apostolic revival. And the first priority of authentic apostolic revival is that Jesus Christ becomes the top priority. 
The top priority in revival must be Jesus. The top priority must not be miracles. It must not be signs. It must not be wonders. And, and I believe in miracles, and I believe God is doing m marvelous things, and there is signs and there are wonders, but we don't need to seek the power of God, but we need to seek Jesus Christ and make Him the center focus of the revival. Here, it's not about our sanctuary. It's not about a building. It's not about property. It's not about the works that we're doing. It's not even about the ministry that we're doing. But when authentic apostolic revival breaks out, Jesus Christ is going to be exalted. He's going to put, be put in his proper place. Come on. It's not about us. It's about Jesus Christ. Oh, can somebody give Jesus oh, the proper praise It's due his name? Oh, somebody shout that name. Jesus. Jesus. You see, on the day of Pentecost, Peter preached to the crowd. He preached to them Jesus. He preached to them about the identity of who Jesus really was. He preached to them Jesus, but also he preached to them about his death, burial, and resurrection. You see, apostolic revival, it emphasizes Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 36, out of the uh, net translation, it renders that verse this way. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know beyond a doubt that God has made this Jesus whom you crucify, both Lord and Christ. He was revealing that he was indeed the Messiah. He was the anointed one. He, he was indeed the God of the Old Testament. And he was being revealed in Jesus Christ. You see, the central theme of what Peter preached to that first crowd was that they crucified Jesus Christ. He preached to them that because of their sin, they caused his death. To have revival, it is vital that men and women know that they themselves crucified Jesus Christ. When we begin to reflect upon our own sins, we'll realize that it's our sins that put Jesus on, on the cross. You see, all of us have sinned and we have fallen short of the glory of God. But true, authentic revival will begin to allow us to realize that we're undone people. We're, we're a people of unclean lips. We're, we're a people that are not perfect. We're not complete. Uh, but it's because of God's grace and God's mercy that we can be restored into a right relationship with Him. So, an authentic revival... Individuals will begin to realize that it was their sins that put him on the cross and that we all indeed stand guilty before a holy God. However, an authentic revival is just as vital for men and women to know that there is mercy to be found at the cross. Oh, I'm thankful that one day I repented of my sins. I was baptized in the precious name of Jesus. I was filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm thankful for the grace and the mercy of God. So the top priority, though, is Jesus. Jesus being the central focus, not only of his identity, but also the cross, his death, burial, and resurrection. And When individuals begin to realize that they're undone and they need the favor and the grace of God, there will be authentic repentance. Authentic apostolic revivals will place a priority on repentance. You know, I'm so thankful that we have many individuals, they come into the service and they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost. But I believe sometimes we circumvent the time that they spend with God in repentance. It's not a just about receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost. We don't need to hasten somebody's repentance. When there's true, authentic, apostolic revival, people will be weeping in the altar. They'll be crying out to God saying, God, forgive me of my sin. God, forgive me of my drug use. God, forgive me of smoking. God, forgive me from participating in alcohol. Forgive me of unholiness. Come on. We don't need to circumvent the repentance that God puts in our life. Well, I think we should just take a time and repent right now. Say, God, cleanse my mind. Cleanse my heart. God, cleanse my attitude. Come on, let's repent before God. 
Come on. Oh, if my people, which are called by my name, if they will repent, if they will humble themselves and repent and turn from their wicked ways, then I will heal their land. Come on, let's just spend the time with the Lord in repentance. Hallelujah, that's all right if God's still moving on you. Connect with God. I I don't want to rush it. Hallelujah. Somebody shout priorities. Priorities. Jesus. Somebody shout Jesus. Jesus. Somebody shout repentance. See, when the message of the cross is delivered in love, individuals should experience godly conviction for their sin. They should not experience shame or guilt. I do not believe that's an emotion that's delivered from God. But we should have holy and and godly conviction that that moves and and motivates us to change our, our life. So when the message of the cross is delivered, people will experience that conviction for their sins and and change their lifestyle. Thus, we must make repentance a leading priority. Notice in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, this is the response to to Peter's address when he began to tell people about Jesus and and him crucified, that he was was crucified, buried, and he rose again, and it was their sins that, that put him on the cross. This was the response of the crowd. Now, when they heard this, they were acutely distressed. They were cut. They were pricked to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, what should we do, brothers? You see, the preaching of Calvary, it leaves a person in no doubt that they put the Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. However, the preaching of the cross also reveals something marvelous. Something marvelous, something beautiful, something high and something lifted up. That there is grace and mercy to be found at the cross of Jesus Christ. There is salvation and restoration at the feet of Jesus. I'm thankful for Calvary. I'm thankful that He bled and He died that you and I, we could have grace and we can experience salvation. So priorities of that first revival was first Jesus and then it was repentance. And once repentance takes place and people see their need for God, they they need to have a plan. And we see the third priority was sharing the plan of salvation. And many of you may think that this is elementary or this is a fundamental, but I believe that the Lord gives us a great blueprint. And I believe we need to follow the blueprint that is revealed in the revival that took place in the book of Acts. But sharing the plan of of salvation, it must be a priority for each one of us. Sharing the gospel message must be a fundamental priority of our lives, second only to our relationship with Jesus Christ. Notice in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, after Peter had preached to them Jesus, after they were convicted, after they began to repent, he shared with them the plan of salvation. For Peter said unto them, Repent, and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promises for you and for your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. You see, after the resurrection, Jesus appeared unto the eleven disciples and gave them the priorities of authentic apostolic revival. In Matthew chapter 28, we see Matthew's record of the Great Commission. Then Jesus came up and said to them, He said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. And I'm thankful to have a revelation of that one singular name. What is the name of the Father? What is the name of the Son? The name of the Holy Ghost. 
It's Jesus because all these three are one. I'm thankful to know that there is only one God. And His name is Jesus. Priorities. And he said, here's a priority, teaching them to obey everything that I have commanded you. And remember, I am with you always to the end of the age. So Jesus was a priority. Repentance was a priority. The plan of salvation was a priority. The fourth priority was baptisms. As the wave of God's Spirit, and it's not just happening here locally, but really around the world, there is a wave of God's Spirit that has been released. As the wave of God's Spirit continues to spread across the world in revival, a priority must be placed on baptism in Jesus' name. You need to begin to talk to your family. The return of the Lord is near. You need to begin to talk to your friends. And if they've never experienced the power of God, the love of God, the forgiveness of God, you need to encourage them to repent of their sins. You need to teach them a Bible study. But we need to be encouraging people to be baptized in the name, the only saving name, the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. And we have the, the truth. We need to propagate it. We need to share it like never before. A Book of Acts revival will place great priority on baptism. Great par- priority on Jesus, repentance, the plan of salvation, but carrying through with baptism. Notice before Jesus' ascension into heaven, He appeared to the eleven disciples and He left them with key instructions for authentic apostolic revival. This is Mark's account for Jesus' commission. Then he appeared to the eleven themselves, and while they were eating, he rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart, because they did not believe those who had seen him resurrected. And then he said to them, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And then he said in verse 16, the one who believes and is baptized will be saved. But the one who does not believe will be condemned. I'm thankful that we understand the truth that God revealed. That it not only takes repentance, but it also takes a baptism in Jesus' name. There's some movements will say you don't need to be baptized to receive salvation. But that's a lie from the pits of hell. That's why we need to get out into our community and say you must be baptized in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Priorities. When repentance and baptism become priorities, there will be an increase in new births. I'm talking about being born of water and of spirit. In Acts chapter 2, verse 41, so those who accepted this message, they were baptized. And that day about 3,000 people were added. In Acts chapter 10, This is when Peter, he went to the household of Cornelius. And Cornelius was a devout man. He was a godly man. He had a relationship with God. He prayed often, and the Bible says he he gave much alms. And they were a memorial before God. There's many hungry people in our community. They love God, and they serve God with all of their heart, all of their soul, and all of their might. You know what is going to happen in this last day? They're going to begin to see visions. They're going to begin to see dreams. I I know that's going to happen. I I know people that's already had dreams and visions. God has spoken to them. God is going to send angels before us uh, to prepare the way just like they did for the household of Cornelius. The Lord sent an angel to Cornelius to prepare him. And he said, I want you to send to Joppa. I want you to send for Peter. He's by the seaside. And I just pause here this morning as I was reading through this account, it leaped off the pages, and I didn't intend to share this, but I want you to notice something. Peter was by the seaside. When there's a jubilee, you know where we need to be? We need to be by the seaside. We need to be by the area that God is gathering the fish. And we need to get a bucket in hand. We need to get a net in hand, and we need to begin to scoop out the fish. From the sea. 
Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. Somebody shout priorities. While Peter was still speaking these words, just to save, save time, I'm not reading through the entire account, but I want you to know what he was, he was preaching right before that. He was preaching Jesus. He was preaching Jesus crucified, Him being buried, and Him being raised from the dead. And when He was preaching Jesus and Him crucified, this is what happened. When He spoke these words, the Holy Spirit fell on all those heard the message. The circumcised believers who had accompanied Peter were greatly astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. And here's how they knew that the Holy Ghost was poured out. For they heard them speak in tongues and praise God. The initial evidence of receiving the baptism of the Holy Ghost is still speaking in other tongues. Oh, I'm thankful that I've had that experience. Don't let anybody put doubt in your mind. That's the initial evidence of receiving the Holy Ghost. Oh, if you've received the Holy Ghost, give God a hand clap of praise. Oh, I feel a praise break. I feel a praise break in my own spirit. I feel a praise break. Why, God's been good to us. Jesus is the center of my life. Oh, go ahead. Put Jesus at the center for a moment. Put him at the center of your praise. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Speaking in tongues and praising God. And watch what happens when they receive the word, the message of Jesus, Him crucified. When they receive that the Holy Ghost was poured out. On the day of Pentecost, He preached, repent and be baptized, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. You see, typically a prerequisite is repentance. And I believe that that is is an essential prerequisite to receive in the Holy Ghost. Because you can't receive the Holy Ghost unless you have a pure heart, unless you have a repentant heart. But there are occasions when people have a pure heart and they've repented and they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost prior to being baptized. Well, here we, we find a unique account. And, and Peter, again, he understood the Word of God. He, he was a Jew. He understood. And I believe he reflected back to the Old Testament and in the Old Testament, when the priest, after they had repented, after they had offered up a sacrifice of, 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 of repentance at the altar, the brazen altar, they would wash in the lever and they would cleanse themselves. But if they skipped over the lever and went into the Holy of Holies where the presence of God was, they would drop dead. I believe Peter understood that. That you can have the baptism of the Holy Ghost and still not be clean before the sight of God. That's why we need baptism in Jesus' name. It cleanses us of our sins. So here's the only account that Peter was this strong. Notice this in verse 47. We're talking about the priority of baptism. He said, no one can withhold the water of these people to be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we did. Can he? And then he said this, he gave orders to have them baptized. The new King James says he commanded them to be baptized. He commanded them. In other words, he said, you're not going to leave here until you're baptized in Jesus' name. Now, I believe they could receive it because their spirit was right. And when they realized they need to be baptized, they were baptized in the only saving name, the name of Jesus Christ. So there was a priority on baptism. But also notice there was a priority on, on prayer. There was a renewed passion for prayer. Authentic apostolic revival. It renews the priority of prayer. 
to the Arise that gathered down here before the service began, thank you. Thank you for beginning to pray and starting the service off with prayer. To every saint of God that was in the prayer room, both man and woman, that was in the prayer room before service and you begin to pray, Pastor thanks you for beginning the fire that we need. Thank you for having a, a, a personal prayer life. When there's authentic apostolic revival, there will be renewed priority of prayer, a renewed priority of worship, and a renewed priority of meditating on Jesus. In Acts chapter 2, verse 42, we notice the fellowship of the early believers. And they were devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching or the apostles' doctrine and to fellowship and to breaking of bread and to prayer. Somebody shout prayer. prayer. Notice that prayer and fellowship are intricately connected together in revival. Fellowship refers to close association involving mutual involvement, but also relationship. In Acts chapter 4, we get a, a revelation, or we get an example of what happens when people unite in mutual involvement, in relationship, but also in prayer. In Acts chapter 4, revival was taking place. In verse 29, and now the Lord, pay attention to their threatens and grant to your servants to speak your message with courage. In the midst of revival, there will be persecution. In the midst of revival, there will be occasion where your family members don't agree with what you were doing. But when that persecution comes, you need to pray to God and say, God, give me even more boldness to proclaim your goodness. Give me more boldness to worship you in beauty and holiness. So they prayed for boldness. In verse 30, while you extend your hand to heal, and bring about miraculous signs and wonders through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. While you're doing these things, when they had prayed, the place where they were assembled together was shaken. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak the word courageously. What would happen if we put prayer back in its proper place? We put it as a top priority in our life. I believe this place would begin to shake. And God would give us the boldness to speak in an hour that needs boldness. Why don't we lift up our hands and pray for that boldness? Come on, let's don't pray for the miraculous. Don't pray for signs and wonders. But let's pray for boldness. Come on, let's pray for boldness. Let's pray for courage. Give us courage, God. Give us boldness, God. Yeah. Hallelujah. Somebody shout priorities. Of authentic apostolic revival. Notice the conditions when authentic apostolic revival is taking place. This was the conditions among the early believers. The group of those who believe were of one heart and one mind. And no one said that any of his possessions was his own. But everything was held in common. It's so a special note, the remark, everything was held in common. It is not a reflection of political philosophy. It's not a reflection of socialism or political philosophy, but of the extent of their spontaneous commitment to one another, it revealed how committed they were to the family of God. And such a response does not have the function of a command, but is reflective of an attitude that Luke thought was important. It was a priority. It was an attitude that commanded or gave evidence of their identification with one another. In other words, they loved one another. They preferred their brother above themselves. And when that happens, it will lead into an additional, additional priority of apostolic revival, and that is this, generosity. You know, but before the service, we have a, a minister's meeting, and, and Bishop, he, he just mentioned, he said, and typically we'll ask the ministers, do you have anything that's on your heart? 
Did God put anything into your spirit? And, and occasionally, and it's always good when God puts something in the minister's heart and mind, uh, but, but no one had anything maybe they, they spoke out uh, about. So in jest, Bishop said, does anyone want to share what's in their wallet? And uh, the ministers laughed, and uh, he was just doing that in jest. But really, generosity is so important in apostolic revival, and it's kind of interesting. When we got up here, Brother uh, Andrew Brown, he pointed out somebody left this uh, credit card on the pulpit. I don't know if anybody lost their credit card. If you did, see me after service. But uh, I guess you're just being generous. I'm going to see if it works after service. So whoever put it up on the pulpit, thank you. But if you lost it and looking for it, please come see me. Because if not, I'm going to see how much is on it. Thank you for your generosity. But generosity is a priority in apostolic revival. Church offerings and other manifestations, manifestations of personal giving to the work of God is a priority in authentic apostolic revival. Now, some of you, maybe you slipped in after we, we took the altar, and I feel just a pause here and give you an opportunity. We've somewhat, we've inverted the service, and typically we have offering a little bit later in the service, so if you s slipped into the service and you missed offering because it was closer to the beginning, I'm going to give you another opportunity, and uh, I encourage you at the end of the service, uh, we're going to have a time of worship. I encourage you come and lay it on the altar, if, or if God moves on you to give some additional funds to the building fund here tonight. We're going to open up the altar, and I want to give you an opportunity to come and give and put your generosity into practice, uh, because again, we, we move this service around to accommodate what I feel the Lord wants to do. But notice their generosity in Acts chapter 2, verse 44. It says, all who believe were together and held everything in common. There we see that, that phrase again, everything was, was held in common. And, and they began selling their property and their possessions. And they began distributing it to the proceeds to everyone. As everyone or anyone had need. Verse 46. And every day they continued to gather together by common consent in the temple courts. Breaking bread from house to house. Sharing their food with glad and humble hearts. Praising God and having the goodwill of all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number every day those who were being saved. Again, when Jesus is exalted, when He's the top priority, when there's repentance, when there's a plan of salvation that's being taught and being preached, there will be baptisms, there will be the infilling of the Holy Ghost, there will be the power of prayer, but we also will see generosity. And when generosity begins to flow out from among us, guess what? The community is going to be drawn to Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, let a spirit of generosity impact us all. And let us let the love that we've received so freely be given to our community. So here's a key understanding. Along with generosity, church activities become a priority in revival. I'm going to say that again. Along with generosity, church activities become a priority in revival. Notice, they had all things common, but then they came together in consent, and they came together in the temple every day. Why? Because there was a church activity. There was a church activity this Monday night, and it was a wonderful time. The ladies came together, and there was beautiful fellowship. I believe in these last days, the people of God, we need to come together. We don't need to forsake the assembling of ourselves together and so much the more as we see the day approaching. So I commend you. Thank you for being here on a Wednesday night. There's a lot of other places that you could have been, but I believe God honors your faithfulness to the house of God. If there's a prayer meeting and you can be there, be at the prayer meeting. If there's a men's activity, be there. Because through that we receive a strength. But notice, they met in the temple when there was church activity. Apostolic revival it creates a greater desire to meet in homes. Also meet at restaurants and other venues to spend time together to share the wow of God. They shared meals together. 
just by a show of hands, and don't feel bad if you haven't done this, but just by a show of hands, how many shared a meal with another family since this last Wednesday in the church? Shared a meal, hold it up high, with another family, not your own family. Since Sunday, if you shared another meal with another family, not your own family, lift your hand up high. I was getting there, Lady McGee. This highlights an importance. We need one another. And and hear me, I'm not trying to startle anyone, but I believe there may come a time as we approach the end time, there's going to be pestilence, there's going to be famine. I've said it before. But I believe there may come a time when the house of God, we need to share meals together. We don't need it just for substance, but guess what? Spiritually, we need to spend time together. Hallelujah. So if you didn't, some of you, you shared a meal with another brother or sister in Christ. How many ladies was at the ladies party? Look how important a church activity is. Fellowship together. How many thankful for your brothers and sisters in Christ? Why don't you just thank God for your brother, your sister in Christ? Praise God. Isn't God good? Priorities. Somebody say priorities. Another priority that we must not lose is this. The wow. (laughs) The wow. The awe. The wonder of God. You see, being in awe of God implies that we have a respect toward Him as well as an attitude of fresh worship and fresh admiration. I believe sometimes our worship and our praise can become routine. It can become can. We know what to do. We know to clap at the right time. If you're apostolic, you know when to stand at the right time. You know when to shout at the right time. You know when to lift your hands at at the right time. And you're doing it just out of habit. But in authentic apostolic revival, what will take place is a fresh awe of the wonder and the majesty of a mighty God. You see, all for God immediately comes with a new surge of passion and zeal. When we have renewed all and it fills our heart, renewed all will fill our worship and reverence and unceasing thanksgiving. Notice in Acts chapter 2, verse 43, reverential awe came over everyone. And when that awe begins to happen, then there will be many wonders and miraculous signs came about by the apostles. You see, God is always present. He's here this very moment. He is here this very time. But in authentic apostolic revival, God's presence becomes personally and collectively obvious among us. When there is a fresh wave of wonder and awe among God's people, there will be conviction of sin. There will be healings. There will be miracles. There will be signs and wonders. But there also will be a mighty outpouring of the Holy Ghost. I encourage us all, could we just stand for a moment, lift up our hands, and let's pray and ask God, align us with apostolic revival. Let's pray and ask God to baptize us with a fresh awe, a fresh wonder of who He is. Could you lift up your voice? Could you lift up your hands? Oh, come on, let's put a priority on worship. That's it, lift up your voice. Don't let it be routine. Uh, Don't let it be rote memory. Oh, don't let it be canned worship here tonight. But oh, David said, bless the Lord, oh my soul. And all that is within me, bless 
His holy name. Could we bless the Lord? Let's bless the Lord together with all our souls.